boa tarde e bem-vindos à, à Biblioteca da, do Museu de Serralves para o primeiro evento ligado ao programa Additional Tones, a Tribute to Marianne Amasher, que, que se inicia hoje com este seminário e sessão de escuta com uh, Amy Tsimini uh, e o Bill Dietz. Uh, e que continuará ao longo deste fim de semana, também com uma sessão de cinema e com dois concertos, para além da apresentação do, do livro, do recente livro, Marian Amasher, Selected Writings and Interviews, que, que vamos também apresentar. Um, antes de mais, queria agradecer-vos a vossa presença aqui, uh, neste momento que é, que é complicado para todos nós. Uh, e, e ao mesmo tempo dizer que sim, sentimos um grande privilégio de poder estar a, a realizar este, este programa uh, neste contexto, que seria um contexto, aliás, que eu creio que seria uma, um, um desafio que talvez a Marian Amasher também gostasse, dado, dado a exploração da, da, da comunicação entre lugares diferentes uh, que ela também explorou. Uh, eu vou passar uh, a inglês uh, para apresentar uh, o Bill Dietz e uh, a Amy Simini, que são os nossos convidados de hoje, mas que não vão estar presentes, estão uh, presentes remotamente, uh, e vou apresentá-los e passar-lhes a palavra. Uh, hello, Amy and Bill. <laughs> Welcome, and, and thank you for uh, your collaboration in this, your precious collaboration in this, in this uh, program. Um, I will give a short introduction to, uh, to our audiences, both the audiences present here uh, at, the, at the library of the museum and also uh, audiences that can uh, Uh, also uh, be uh, through streaming. So I will give a short introduction to your, your uh, um, bio. So uh, and for our audiences, Amy Simini is a historian and performer of music from the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, broadly, she's interested in how performers, composers, and audiences practice and theorize listening as an expression of community sociability and political alliance, with special focus on improvisation, sound art, and installation practices. Um, uh, Simini has researched and uh, given talks and written about the work of Marian Amisher. She is the author of Wild Sound, Marian Amisher, and the Tense of Audible, Audible Life, a book to be pub published by Oxford Uni University Press. Uh, Bill Dietz is a composer and writer. Since 2012, he has been co-chair of music and sound in Bard College Master's program. His work on genealogy of the concert and the performance of listening has brought him to festivals such as Mare's Music or uh, Danau Schinger Music Tag, museums such as Hamburger Bahnhof, Tate Modern, and uh, Museo de Arte Contemporaneo de Ochaca. Um, and also, is uh, fr from 2016 to 2017, he, uh, he was professor of sound at the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne. And uh, in 2015, uh, a monograph of his tutorial diversions was released. Uh, he's a founder member of the Marian Amasher Foundation, created with the aim of broadening the, a, a greater public's understanding of Amasher and their work. Both Amy Simini and Bill Dietz are members of Supreme Connections, a group of Amasher's former collaborators that joined forces to collectively engage with the questions of the posthumous life of, and of her site adaptive work. Uh, they are the editors of the book uh, that we are also presenting uh, this evening, Marian Amisher's Selected Writings and Interviews, which is the first ever book-length collection devoted to, a comp to this composer, to, to Marian. Um, 
So uh, we are gathered here around uh, the work and life of, uh, of Marian Amisher, which is a, uh, a crucial figure in the music history, uh, and al although not so well known from the uh, from the general audiences, but we hope to be able to contribute to a change uh, on that issue. Uh, Amy and uh, Bill, uh, I. Well, I, you can <laughs> take on from, from now. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro. Um, okay, yeah, great. Um, I don't hear myself repeating. Um, hello to everyone, um, both there in the room and wherever you are in the world. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we're a little bit sad that we can't be there in the room with all of you in Portugal. Uh, but at the same time, in a way that we will uh, look forward to talking about today, meeting remotely uh, in whatever form is something that's not at all incompatible with uh, Marian Amache's practice. Um, not just in the literal sense of her more than 20 years of work in remote and telematic formats. Uh, she, her first telematic piece was in City in 1967, and then she did the 22 iterations of uh, City Links pieces all the way through 1981. But her sort of commitment to the possibilities uh, of telematic formats um, were very much in keeping with her broadest uh, or broader interests in um, complicating and understanding and really above all else sensing different forms of presence or really thinking what what presence even means and so in a funny way sort of as a starting point with that it's it, this this strange kind of horrific past year really highlights in a funny way yet another aspect of Amishay's work that seems incredibly prescient um, you know, in, in so much of, uh, of the pandemic-related uh, changes of work and, and public presentation in the last year, there's there's been this, like, incredibly sometimes disturbing kind of reactionary and ableist resistance to remote platforms, um, which sort of doubled down on a, on a funny kind of fetishization of, of overly simplistic notions of liveness. And... Um, what I think we're hoping to expand on today um, is how Amishay's work sort of addressed this in a very sophisticated way uh, already starting in the 1960s. Great. Thank you so much, Bill, and greetings to everyone. It's great to be here with you in whatever form you're experiencing us and uh, this presentation. So. We have opted for a sort of hybrid format of sorts in which um, the audio and the video that we'll share today is actually not going to be streamed, but will be played directly from the space um, in the museum where those of you um, have gathered. Um, and these are gonna be played from files that Amache herself might have used. Um, However, this of course makes them no more live than if we were already, if, than if we were also in the room with you. Um, it simply helps us ward off streaming issues. But um, on the other hand, as we talk about some of these um, City Links pieces that again begin in the late 1960s and really effloresce through the 1970s, um, we'll see Amishade like very, like deeply and complexly concerned with how remote transmission sound co-mingles with um, sound in situ to give rise to many layered and complex ways of listening. Um, and in that sense, um, nothing we're gonna share today can be a work. And I put scare quotes around work very intentionally. Um, everything we share will instead be a kind of document. But again, we have to ask sort of what does that mean and why is this so important um, when approaching um, Amish's work and practice? And these are some of the issues that we'll delve deeply into um, in the presentation today. Yeah, so um, with that, I think we, we'll sort of want to dive into material 
kind of right away because as usual, Amy and I have been doing these presentations for the past, I guess, five or so years now, and we always have way too much to share. So we have a sort of limited uh, time frame tonight. We're kind of mashing the seminar and listening session together uh, in one. So um, the starting point tonight will be a, a particular piece. And so as many of you know, and maybe those of you who are there in the um, in situ audience, maybe you were even there. In 2002, Amache made a two-part work for Sir Alves, um, a work which sort of interestingly was also one of the very few that uh, in retrospect, she was very fond of. Uh, you know, she was actually incredibly critical of her own work and um, hyper aware of the sort of different presentational limitations that a lot of situations uh, sort of forced onto her work. Um, so anyway, um, we want to start from that particular piece and um, to try to mediate the various questions and problems around understanding what that work even is. Um, this is the beautiful image you see here of, um, of Amche from her studio at MIT in the 1970s. And um, it's also on the cover of the, the book that Amy and I uh, edited that's just been released. Um, if we could just go right into the first video, which is video B01, it's about six minutes long and um, we'll just sort of give you like go right into the uh, documentation of the 2002 work.
thank you. Um, yeah, if we could just uh, go back to the presentation. Um, so that those were some clips um, from the this two day or two um, two part series that Marianne did there in two thousand two. If we go to the next image, um, yeah, this um, um, we can maybe talk more a little bit in detail about some of the the the, the aspects of this work and, and actually maybe Pedro Rocha there can tell us more about some of these images. There are these kind of funny. Uh, bathroom selfies um, that um, that uh, that Amish I made in this video while she was preparing there. Um, but for the most part, I think at the moment, again, as our starting point, we, we want to talk about what this work was, not so much in the sense of the specific components or elements uh, of it that were present at the time, which you saw in the video, inc include these uh, incredibly striking visual elements, the, the red um, foot things, the goats, the costumed performers, the lighting, the, the, the stuff in the bathroom, all of these elements, which, you know, um, don't at least immediately or colloquially have anything to do with how we might think of the sort of uh, very limited formal genre of, so quote unquote, sound art. Um, but what I think we can do rather is sort of contextualize this work within a very long term terrain of Marianne's thinking um, that connects to what Amy and I were saying at the beginning about notions of presence and appearance and such. Um, if we can go to the next image, please. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm not sure you can see that super clearly, um, but what this is, uh, just as a little bit of, of an indicator and to talk about where we are in terms of Amche research these days, um, this is a screenshot of um, the spreadsheet um, that at the moment um, is the inventory of what all is in the Amche collection that has recently been handed over to the New York Public Library where it will find its uh, permanent home. And um, I don't know if you can see it there, but I'm just looking on my screen as well. Um, in box M915901, um, you see reference to, for instance, blue folder with production agenda, ag agenda for Sir Alves Porto, as well as red folder with notes in lighting for Sir Alves Porto. Um, and unfortunately, as you can see on the right, there's nothing in the right column. What this means is that uh, these folders have not really been looked at in depth and they've not been digitized at all. Um, if we go to the next image, um, similarly here, you can see, or if you can see that, it, it says, for instance, um, uh, what does it say here? Uh, production notes are always email to P. Rocha um, in box M925902. And so my point in showing these images is also just to emphasize what we don't know around this piece. Um, so um, if we go to the next image, um, this is just another one of these sort of mysterious um, glamorous bathroom selfies uh, from that time. And I think this sort of lays the sort of entry or groundwork um, for what we'd like to say. And it sort of, again, um, to sort of emphasize the starting point of what we don't know, um, Amy and I, in putting together the selected writing books, felt that was really important. Um, because Marianne Amache's works have been so inaccessible for so long, um, you know, she, she died now gosh, almost 12 years ago. Um, and in that time, um, there have been almost no publications. Um, there have been these kind of speculative presentations of works that we've been involved with, with the Supreme Connections Group, et cetera. Um, but so there's a lot of sort of myth making around her. And of course, this is something that she contributed to in a kind of interesting and complex way. Um, but now where we're at the beginning, the starting point where quote unquote proper research, whatever that means can begin, um, at least where the world theoretically uh, can hopefully soon have access to what remains of, uh, of her collection, her materials in the public library. Um, we thought it very important to start with what we don't know. So I'd just like to read um, before we get into more images, uh, actually a quotation from the introduction to uh, the selected writings that Amy wrote. Uh, our introduction begins, we have to start with her refusals because we still don't understand them. 
Marianne Amche's work cannot be experienced on a CD or on YouTube. Marianne Amache's work never happened in one-off festival slot performances. Marianne Amache's work is not music, if you assume that music is a discrete, live or recorded stretch of audio transmitted through the air to be listened to attentively or distractedly in a concert or domestic setting. As vivid as the experience of some aspects of her work mediated by those formats undoubtedly is for admirers around the world, she vehemently refused those formats throughout her life. Now, for the first time since her passing in 2009, with the placement of her archive at the New York Public Library, we can finally begin to understand her work as she herself conceived it. This move toward approaching her work on her own terms is not a matter of fidelity, which is also to say everyone is as free as ever, of course, to mishear and to misunderstand things, but rather one of intensity, of excitement. That is, as vivid as the secondhand or compromised experiences of her work might be, which is to say by YouTube, on CD, etc., what sounds, ideas, sensations, and relations have remained inaccessible until now, and are preserved in the archive, are drastically stronger and more urgent. And to that wonderful passage that highlights intensity and excitement um, alongside um, Sort of thinking through Amache's own proposals, I'd like to also read another short passage from our introduction that sort of helps us sort of begin to think or even feel through the idea of Amache sort of on the threshold between realization and speculation, um, sort of trying to inhabit that complex like liminal space is one of the things that I personally find so compelling and um, so exciting about um, learning about her work and life. So I'll go ahead and read, read a short portion of the text here. Her work as she envisioned it, however, may never have been fully realized in her lifetime. Large architecturally staged works in St. Paul, San Francisco, Krems and Tokushima are among the precious few that she would recount with affection. But what even to call such works? Where to place these works in light of her emphatic rejection of both museum-oriented installation formats and concert-oriented recital formats? How even to begin thinking about works that occurred as developing serial occasions across multiple, quote, sound joined rooms, end quote, filled not only with structure born and airborne sound, but with text, video, 3D projections, and other props. The paucity of Amache materials published in her lifetime in no way reflects the amount of work on hand, nor a fundamental impossibility. On numerous occasions, she points towards potential ways to publish and distribute her work, none of which, however, was ever supported such that it came to be. And I think that what that passage that Amy just read also kind of highlights is that there are sort of heavy stakes in these kind of things that we're talking about as well. And I think that's one thing that we've really tried to kind of to do our best to quote unquote get right in um, our shepherding of the archive uh, thus far is um, yeah she she was often very unhappy uh, and frustrated with um, the ways in which different presentational formats institutions institutional logics uh, kind of constrained um, her sort of powers of imagination so. Um, we're going to now do a little bit of a historical route through sort of different um, different passages in her work that we hope will sort of illuminate the way to uh, a way to understand the format or the specificity in her own terms of what she offered in Porto in uh, 2002. And in a sense that starts in the broadest way with uh, like a kind of notion of what she insistently says throughout her life um, uh, as ways of hearing. 
Um, it's actually kind of remarkable if you, you look, have uh, like tastes of her writing from the 60s up until her death in 2009. Uh, again and again, this phrase, ways of hearing, is foregrounded uh, often in, in all caps. Um, and she really insists in all kinds of different and all kinds of specific and complicated ways throughout her life that how one hears, how one hears something, how one receives something is as or perhaps even more important than what it is one is hearing. There's really kind of a centering of reception, uh, which is really the starting point for what she does, which if you want, you might also think of as sort of taking the sort of radical moment of John Cage, the sort of turn to reception implied, at least in four minutes and 33 seconds, to take that not as some kind of mythic sort of silly kind of quote unquote end of art avant-gardist thing, but rather a reset. Uh, re-centering of the listener, of us, our bodies, of particular situated bodies, as the starting point for all kinds of aesthetic production. Um, so yeah, the image I think that you have in front of you now um, is maybe one of the earliest places where we can trace this. Um, this is um, from sort of the last classical piece that Amishay made, and by classical I mean um, sort of within the tradition of, of Western European um, notated concert music, recital music, which is the tradition in which Amishé um, was educated early on. And what you see there is a page of the score. Uh, it's a piece for two percussionists and electronics. Uh, and if you're familiar with this kind of music, it's it's a it's a innovative notation, but it's also certainly still within the world of notations of concepts that are in current are sort of current in 1964, 1965, 1966 when she's working on this and, and, and doing it. Um, essentially, the score shows how the percussionists are sending particular kinds of sounds through the room. There are four loudspeakers around the room. Each percussionist can send their sounds to any of the four loudspeakers. So there's a very dynamic spatial um, spatial relationship going on between the musicians. If we can have the next image. Uh, here you just see a little bit more of that. Um, I mean, we could talk, we could give an entire seminar just about this, of course, um, but what we want to emphasize um, in looking at this is that already in this sort of quote-unquote classical piece, there is this nascent turn toward reception, towards the centering of hearing and the listener versus the producer, the artist. So if we get up the next image. So I'll just read this aloud. This is from, there, there are really extensive notes for this piece. The, the, the quote unquote score itself of the piece is maybe, I forget, maybe six pages long, but there's something like 20, 30 pages of notes surrounding it. Um, Amishay writes, graphic indications on the score function as signs for the detailed listening and playing instructions described in the written text accompanying the score. This notation was the most efficient set of signs I could devise for directing concentration to the complex listening requirements of the work. The score is not graphic in the sense that its shapes are suggestive of musical or acoustical interpretations. It is actually a negative notation with regard to interpretation and visual information. Once familiar with the signs, they are easily recognized at a glance, and except for perhaps the spatial indications, there should be little need to read the score during preparation and performance of the music. Attention can be entirely free for hearing. So, so this remark is, again, if you're familiar with this kind of work from the period, and you don't have to be, but if you are, actually quite striking, um, because so much of the innovations in graphic notation were exactly about creating these kind of suggestive shapes and sort of interpretation of the score. Uh, and in a funny sense, when I say that, what I also mean is that so much of the work from that period, whether it's Cornelius Cardew or Christian Wolff or John Cage, was pretty squarely situated still within that kind of Western producer-centered, artist-centered paradigm of work creation. And when you see this note, and you read what she says about it as a negative notation, one comes to understand that already in this very early phase of Amche's thinking, she's interested in something really different, which is again, as I would put it, this kind of turn towards the centering of the listener.
Wonderful. So if um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, um, we just, yeah, we just saw uh, two pieces, uh, two pages of graphical notation, two out of five um, in this early percussion work. Um, it was performed um, twice in fall of 1966 when Amashe was a creative associate at the um, um, the State University of New York at Buffalo. Um, what we see here um, is the program guide for um, really one of her next big projects um, that on the one hand makes a big break from the concert hall style of presentation um, in which these the performances of the percussion uh, project took place, um, but all these ways like a real a real deepening of um, what kinds of ways of listening people could explore. In this case, um, through environmental sound. So uh, we see May 1967 program guide. Um, this is a WBFO public radio um, based in Buffalo, New York, um, and. Over the uh, weekend in late May that actually coincided with a bunch of events at the university, um, Amashe undertook a 28-hour radio broadcast in which she um, transmitted live sound from eight different sites throughout the city of Buffalo. They were a range of types of locations um, that included um, industrial sites, um, um, downtown kind of commercial sites. So it was a mixture of kind of downtown sociability sound worlds and then also um, sounds at the airport, the grain mills, power plant, etc. cetera. Um, so she routed these live feeds to, um, to the control room at WBFO and then mixed the feeds live for the duration of um, of the of the weekend and um, began to sort of imagine how like sounds sort of elsewhere um, distant from one another were sort of waiting to be heard and waiting to be celebrated by listeners that through the broadcast kind of um, uh, sort of come together in the same instant of time um, with sounds that would otherwise remain um, distant and unheard. So um, here we kind of see the blossoming of um, ways of listening that have to do with the remote presence of distant locations um, as a way of coming together um, socially as listeners. She often talked about radio as the air we all share or the weather that we all share. Um, so this broadcast sort of, you know, was supposed to bring together listeners um, sort of in those, in that kind of remote presence. Um, uh, do you want to add anything, Bill? Or, um... No, no, I think that's a remarkable uh, sort of opening. I mean, I think where, where we're going next, it's it's just one of the kind of funny aspects of Marianne. Um, this this piece that Amy's talking about uh, in City um, in 1967, when it's conceived, it's just kind of interesting chronologically that, uh, you know, this is only a few years away from the piece I was just talking about adjacencies, this kind of classical piece. So I think she's, she's at the time when she's making it, maybe thinking of it a little bit more as a work, sort of, although a lot of the components of it really exceed that. Um, but she's a little bit closer to that classical paradigm. But what's interesting is that where we're going to go next, uh, within the next few years, when the City Link series really full on starts, um, which the next iteration of is not is in the early 70s, obviously retroactively retitles the work in City to uh, City Links number one. So it's sort of in, in, in a sort of interesting way, sort of actually sort of deterritorializes that uh, the, the piece as an individual work and includes it rather in this kind of iterative uh, series that she's then engaged in for a while. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, great. Um, um, interestingly, between this, between this big radio broadcast in 1967 and when Amache um, sort of restarts the City Link series in 1963, um, she's sort of in a like a an interstitial period where um, she seems to have been like interested in. Con continuing these broadcast series, but um, before joining the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, is unsure whether she'll have access to the technological means to undertake another broadcast project. And so at that time, writes a series of um, sort of text pieces that elaborate different ways of these long distance ways of listening um, without also um, relying on um, remote circuitry or uh, technical resources. Um, accompanying these pieces is um, what I guess I sometimes call a manifesto. It's called long distance music. And so if it's okay, I'm just gonna read a tiny, tiny passage from her long distance music text, just to kind of continue to bring us into um, understanding these various ways of listening associated with um, connection across distance and in time. So I'm gonna read this little bit and then transition right into the city links uh, in earnest, if that's okay, Bill. Um, oh, please. Great. Okay. I also have the book right here with me, which is such a pleasure to read to you from, from the text. Um, the experience of being in more than one place at one time, ear is the channel, it activates. We travel, the ear is this awareness. This is what we can, we are in more than one place at the same moment of time. Ordinary experience does not provide this. Mind can, music can. We are also traveling together. We become aware of this. Being in one spot, yet in more than one place at the same moment of time. Becoming aware of this through ear, glue of one conditioning vanish, vanishing. Discovering that we are, quote, standing completely still, as though in the center of a leap, carrying our homes within us, which enable us to fly, end quote. Okay. So this image, oh, if we could actually go back to the previous slide. Um, this image shows us um, Amache in this amazing red sweater in her um, studio in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, when she was a fellow at the uh, Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And um, as you can see sort of up on the wall in this, in this photograph, we see these, these kind of stacked gray blocks. Um, and at that time, um, uh, what was transmitted through that technology was um, a live feed that was transmitted from um, Pier 6 um, at the Boston Harbor. And so for the three years of her fellowship, um, Amache basically lived with this incoming sound um, and so really learned its its cycles, its nuances, sort of came to understand the feed as sort of transforming um, spectral and acoustical shapes. Um, and again, sort of began to really live with long distance sound transmission and sound to um, as this kind of double presence, as she says in this text, being in more than one place at the same time. Um, and then she used this harbor feed in a number of um, subsequent City Links installations. And if we can maybe go to the next slide, please. Wonderful. Um, and so this is the, um, the gallery display for um, one of the early City Links projects titled Hearing the Space Day by Day Live. And um, her 
one of the things she often wrote about was really wanting to make sure visitors to the installation knew that they were not hearing um, uh, they, that they were that they were not hearing recorded sound, um, that they weren't hearing pre-programmed sound, but instead the sound that was coming into the gallery from the pier, and again it was coming in through these you know through these blocks here on the left hand side of the screen. She wanted them to really understand that it was coming in live, and to then ask themselves, okay. Um, what are the ways of listening that I that I employ when I'm hearing two spaces layered, um, like layered and woven in together with one another? Um, as you can see, she also employed pages from the percussion, uh, the percussion piece, pages from the piece called adjacencies, and then pasted into this image onto the score are actually photographs of the of the location where she had placed the remote microphone. Um, so here we can see her utilizing um, uh, almost props, um, visual materials, visual cues to really cast listeners into this way of listening to two locations at once into sort of being in the middle of this doubled or um, interstitial kind of presence. It's, it's kind of remarkable to see the, the kind of um, recycling or continuation of use of the notation from the previous piece. It's, it, it almost sort of does the work of the historian for them in the sense of making links between these really disparate kinds of work. Um, and, and what it really underscores is that there's, if there's a continuity between something like adjacencies and, um, and this uh, new series, City Links, it is, again, in the sort of way of listening and uh, to what specifically um, she is listening in in those different works, um, so that's a, I think a really illuminating uh, illuminating thing to look at. Um, yeah, if, uh, I guess if we could go to the next slide, this sort of actually jumps us ahead a little bit. Um, this uh, takes us to the second half of the 1970s and sort of in parallel with the City Links works that she's making, um, she's also taking some commissions. And one of the pieces that she makes in that period is, um, is a collaboration, uh, what is the right way of putting it? I was gonna say a collaboration for, I guess it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's music for a dance by the Merce Cunningham Company, uh, a dance of Cunningham's called Torse and a piece of hers called uh, Remainder. It has actually a much longer, more complicated title than that. But, um, and this is again sort of this, this piece, which we want to discuss a little bit, Remainder slash Torse, is an interesting other transitional piece where you see the sort of listening logic, the way of listening, way of hearing logic of the city links again in transition into a new phase of her work. And in a certain sense, the work that she does for Cunningham and Remainder is very much in keeping with how she may have been working in the sort of with the audio, at least the audio components of the city links pieces. And yet through doing this in a particular realization, a particular performance of that piece, um, she sort of opens out into what will be the next big phase of her work, um, where that sort of notion of listening is expanded yet again into something else. Um, so this picture in particular comes from uh, Caracas, Venezuela, at the Teatro Nacional, where um, the Cunningham Company was presenting this dance. Uh, if we could see the next slide, please. Uh, you see the auditorium here. It's an old kind of colonial auditorium, uh, a wooden structure, um, kind of a horseshoe theater. And um, the, the, the piece, uh, I mean, just like anecdotally, or it's maybe interesting, maybe not interesting, um, funny about this piece is it's one of the few things that Amache, um would allow to be performed without her. Um, in almost every case, all the city links and everything, um, she she sort of really strenuously resisted the idea that the works could sort of be 
um, realized without her ears. And I think what this emphasizes for our purposes is also, yet again, the distance from the notion of the sort of discrete work. Um, you know, in the City Links period, uh, pieces that Amy's talking about, what's so fascinating, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit known art historically, but um, perhaps not quite as known as other telematic work from the period because there are no documents of the audio per se as such. Um, because Amache insisted that the work was not necessarily constituted by the sound. Um, it's a live feed. Obviously, she's not in control in any way of what that feed is, like what's happening on the other side of the microphone. Uh, it's entirely contingent. It's it's changing constantly. Um, and the, that it wasn't the point anyway. She emphasizes again and again that she's not interested in the anecdotal acousmatic information coming from the other side, rather how these sort of transmissions mediate forms of presence, forms of appearance, disappearance, etc. Okay, so Back to this piece, though, um, she tells a wonderful story about this particular performance in Caracas. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll read something aloud. Um, uh, I'll just let it, the story be told in her words. She says, structure born is when you get the sound to travel through, let's say, wood or stone or another material. For example, once in an old theater, I was performing with the Merce Cunningham Company repertoire work. It was an old horseshoe theater in Caracas, and we had not good loudspeakers. I just suddenly decided to put these speakers into the horseshoe. There were only two of them, and they were to fill this huge old hall, and it was incredible what happened. I mean, sound was coming out of every balcony. The American ambassador there came up to John Cage, who was also there performing, and he hadn't really read the program, so he said, Oh, your music has changed so much. I've heard all these angels. Because there was like choirs coming out of all these balconies, because the sound had gotten into the structure of this shape and into this wonderful old building. And that's what I am talking about. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, let's just see. Um, Yeah, this is a, this is sort of another account uh, of, of what's going on there, and this sort of accounts for how this sort of transitions into the next work with this notion of structure-born sound. As she says, what I do is to go to a place, and then in some places it's really difficult, like Cap Street was really a difficult space acoustically, but I was able to do good work there because I had these really wonderful Meyer loudspeakers. In some places, there are a few really incredible places you can run into where you can really sense this out and do it. Like this place I mentioned in Caracas was one I could just sense that something wonderful would happen without too much trouble with, with any kind of junk box speaker, you know, that wasn't too badly off, I could make something happen. I don't know the rules really, so it's an intuitive thing. It's going to the space, finding these kinds of spots where the sound can sort of take on its life and traveling through the structure one way or another. And then you find or know that you're able to place the speakers. Uh, I think maybe I won't read the rest of that, um, um, that quote, but what I can sort of say about that is you have this opening into what will then become one of the many kind of strong modes of her work for the rest of her life, which is, again, in the terms that we're pursuing in terms of ways of listening, looking at how modes of listening or sort of nascent forms of audibility are implicit or embedded materially in a given structure. So wherever one is, if one thinks of the structure not as a passive space, a passive receptacle, but rather as a, a materiality that can, um, that can facilitate the transmission of vibration in a particular way, then any given space is in a certain sense a nascent mode of listening, way of listening, uh, a kind of acoustic filter, um, if you will. Um, and so what she's talking about when she talks about this performance in, in uh, Caracas is then how she, in this case by chance, learns that if she started to transmit sound through the building itself, through the material substrate of a place, and I mean that extreme, like 
100% literally, not at all fancifully or fantastically, that um, this sort of activates these ideas in a very, very different way. And as she says here, like when she's when she's uh, writing this, or I think this is a transcript of an interview, it's very, um, it's very uh, spoken. Um, but uh, when she's saying this, it's still a sort of new idea. So she says it's intuitive. Of course, later she'll become much more systematic in the way she deals with this. Um, um, but this allows her to engage with space in like a fundamentally different way, in keeping with this sort of um, yeah, the centering of, of reception um, that I've been trying to get at. And this then opens up into the work that she mentions here, Cap Street and others, these other work series that we'll get to in a few moments. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, do you think um, we could we could go directly to those works now? Or if you think we should look a little more at, at City Links? Well, I think let's, should we listen to the excerpt oh, from Romania? Yes, yes, and yes, yes then, I forgot about And that. then from there, let's, um, let's kind of choose one of our two paths. Wonderful. So if you, if, if you all could play, um, it's just an audio file, but if you could play the audio file labeled C01, and this is an excerpt from the music for the Cunningham uh, dance piece, Remainder.
crazy. Yeah, it's just starting over. Yeah, um, so, you know, it's kind of absurd to hear excerpts of these things. And as, as Amy said at the beginning, we're really not playing works in any sense here. Um, any of the things that we've played or will share today would have been meticulously installed by Amache. And as we're sort of saying here, how they're installed was at times as or almost more important to what the audio bits themselves were. Um, so again, these things that we're sharing are just these sort of strange auditory material traces, tastes of, of things. Um, just to sort of close out this sort of remainder tourist thing, um, um, before we sort of jump ahead a little bit, um, I, I can just sort of again uh, sort of emphasize another aspect of the City Link series, uh, an aspect that, that we're sort of that we've been touching on again and again, which is their resistance to the notion of the closed work. Um, the materials that we heard in that brief excerpt, two primary things, one this kind of deep sound, one this kind of buzzy, uh, as she would say, ear tone sound, um, are actually materials that uh, she reuses and iterates in different places again and again, almost through the rest of her life, which is also then to say that those specific bits of audio, those bits of material are do not necessarily constitute the work remainder or a work remainder. Rather, the, they are these components that help articulate a particular um, sonic relationality or something like this um, that the, the given instance of the piece um, is tasked with sort of presenting. Um, so the, the first sound, the low sound, um, you know, sort of anecdotally is, as far as we can tell, the sound of a boat, which likely comes from uh, Pier 6, uh, from the, this early City Links piece that Amy mentioned before. And the other sound, we actually, as far as I know, I don't think we know where that comes from. It's certainly not generated um, by the Muse, tri the Tridex Muse synthesizer that she would use around the same time to generate uh, her other sort of well-known uh, ear tone music. Uh, it seems to come from somewhere else. Um, perhaps um, uh, the surge synthesizer, if it is indeed at all created through synthesis, perhaps it's a, another sort of anecdotally uh, recorded um, uh, live sound bit. Uh, all that we know is that she would again use this in different contexts for the rest of her life and that she called it Fina. Um, she, she would give these, these sounds different names. So um, I think, like as I was saying at the beginning, we, we tend to over-prepare. We're going to skip ahead quite a bit. I'm not sure if um, our, our friend there who's doing the presentation can see the numbers. If, if you can, we'd like to jump to slide 27, um, which is several slides ahead. It's a, a slide um, that, um, it's, it's, a, it's an actual slide. <laughs> uh, uh, slide image um uh, if we can see that and i think i'll hand over to amy uh, i think just one or two more further um, let's just see there we are that one great whoops amy i can't hear amy okay there you are um you can hear me now yeah right yeah this is like a slide inside a slide <laughs> um I love the way you kind of summarize the question of structure born sound as quote sort of every building structure as itself a mode or a way of listening. Um, and I think a great way to describe um, the work series that Amashe called um, music for sound joined rooms. Um, which embraces the practice of structure born sound in a very robust way, but also combines that practice um, with a lot of what we saw earlier um, in hearing the space day by day live to say the use of props or other visual cues as conceptual supports for the ways of listening into which Amache also invited um, audience or experiencers. Um, so what we're looking at here is a photograph from uh, June 1980. Um, this is the, um, the kind of large rambling house uh, in which she staged um, the first piece 
in the Music for Sound Join Room series, um, which was titled Living Sound Patent Pending. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of historical background um, because the sort of some of the stories behind um, sort of who, what this house was and how Amashe came to work there um, actually also impact the kinds of, of visual cues and props that she included in the piece. So just a little bit of background here. Um, Living Sound Patent Pending took place um, as part of the New Music America Festival um, hosted by the Walker Art Center um, in the Twin Cities in, um, in Minnesota. Um, it uh, took place, it was like a, a late night event. So it took place like after midnight. And this is the home of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra conductor, um, Dennis Russell Davies, who had departed um, his tenure with the orchestra maybe about two months before the festival took place. Um, that departure was actually really big news in the city at the time. Um, Davies was sort of credited with sort of bringing the orchestra into a space of contemporary music performance. And in the local press, when music critics reported on Davies run, um, leaving the orchestra, they also wrote about Amache's piece, Living Sound Patent Pending. Um, so it was sort of it was sort of presented local press as um, as sort of part of the same. Uh, news arc having to do with the, uh, the the cultural life of the city. And uh, this is interesting because, as we'll see in the clues that Amache sets up, um, the idea of the orchestra plays a really important role in the uh, the story that um, um, that this piece that this piece invited audiences to experience. Um, but let's go back again to the question of structure born sound. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So by sending sound sort of first through the um, kind of built material of, of the house, um, the idea is that the house would act like a kind of filter. Um, so to create sort of three-dimensional sonic shapes that um, Amache sometimes called characters that um, would kind of concentrate in particular places um, in, in the house or in the structure. Um, we could think of them as kind of um, like acoustical or spectral guides. <laughs> Um, and accompanying these shapes, she also would sometimes place um, a, an object or a piece of text so that you would sort of encounter the sonic shape and the, and the object sort of at the same time to create a sort of special point of focus um, in the audience's listening. And I'm going to go ahead and read this text. Um, which describes how these points of special focus were supposed to function as what she called clues to a story. So I'm just going to go ahead and read um, and read this um, this short bit of writing. She writes, "To experience the work, one stands, walks, sits, listens, looks, and reads individually in personal time." rather than in the group time of the stage audience. So again, this continued like distancing from the concert environment. Sound shapes are found in the air. We stop to listen as we look at paintings on the wall. Stopping renews, charges attention. Walking, we feel the sound move around and through us. Images function as stopping points, spots of special focus, and are intended to trigger thoughts, stimulate dormant energies. Images and words become the clues, characters, and script we shape together with the sound. Where we find tones and images, the way we might first see from the corner of an eye, bend down to read, notice, then look close, see the wall, then consider we might be in a human laboratory. Imagine
undulating in a fast and silent car. These are critical to the experiences that I am creating. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Awesome, great. Um, so we have some really wonderful uh, photographic documents of the way in which um, Amish set up these spots of special focus in um, Davy's former house. And I think um, the passage that I just read like gives us some really interesting ways to try to um, like kind of hypothetically imagine ourselves inside this photograph um, amidst the spatial dynamics of structure born sound. So if we take a look at this music stand that's kind of nestled in the corner here, um, sort of we might imagine sort of turning our backs to the corner to sort of to read what's on the stand and then encountering a specific like concentrated sonic shape right there in the corner. Right. Or if we look at the very front of the image, there is an in, there's a, um, an in, a, a, a metal instrument case and um, sitting in front of it is a, um, a TV storyboard with actually very tiny typewritten text in it on it. Um, rather. And so imagine again that you bend down, you crouch a little bit to read what is written um, on that storyboard. And then the idea again as this point of special focus is that you encounter another concentrated sonic shape um, sort of slithering along the floor um, that you sort of experience um, um, as you read. So these are some ways to sort of imagine the interaction between sound characters and props um, that Amish does write about as a kind of virtual transport into the scene um, or um, into this world of a story um, comprised of clues that you sort of put together as you move actively and in personal time um, through the house. So if we can go please to the next slide. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Here's yet, a, here's yet another scene um, staged in the house. Each room was staged as sort of a, with a different theme or a different set of clues. And if we can go through to the next slide, please. Okay, wonderful. Um, here's another wonderful passage um, in which uh, the text is written in the in the um, in the third person, but this is very much Amish's voice. Um, and this is a really, really wonderful account of the like intensity of um, living sounds um, um, sound world. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. It gives a really an intense account to of uh, the feeling of really being moved or like, or transported through the house by the sort of sheer sonic force of structure born sound as she presented it in Living Sound. So I'll go ahead and read this, um, this really vivid text um, to you. Um, meanwhile, she writes, the entire ground floor of the house was full of a spectacular sound incredibly loud and unbelievably dense. It poured out of giant loudspeakers circulating through the rooms, out and windows, down the hill, past sedate Victorian mansions. Um, Davy's house was in a very she-she uh, neighborhood in St. Paul. Um, it seemed to contain all energy and all frequency ranges at once, and yet never approached white noise. A visitor who stepped off limits into the kitchen was literally slammed up against the refrigerator by the force of the energy. Others felt themselves pushed as if by acoustic pressure out into the garden where the entire house was heard sounding as a giant instrument. There they could notice a second sound emanating in low quiet waves from the basement a second piece of music, Nightbreak. And through the window, there could be seen projected in the basement wall, the same quote about neutrinos that had been in the music room. 
Great, thank you. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Um, so one thing that that sentence really captures is the way in which, again, sonic character, sound characters are coordinated with images and projections in order to kind of create this very active way of moving through the house and to create these clue-based itineraries, if you will. Um, so another, uh, let's see. Um, what we're seeing here now is, um, Bill, did you want to jump in? Oh, no, no. I was just, I mean, I, I know you're getting to it, but I was wondering in a funny way, after that wonderful passage you just read, if it might actually be a nice time to play the sound. Yeah, in, oh, in part because yeah. I think because I think after that incredibly vivid description you just made, whatever we hear, however interesting it will be, will be so paltry in relation to that. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, is, thank you. I'm so glad. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, which is not at all to denigrate the, the, the sound, and it's this wonderful thing, but just exactly as Amy's describing, both the, the physical force of how it would have been projected and the care to which she had installed it, like really, as Amy is saying, to the degree to which, depending on where your head is th in three dimensions, she has pre-imagined that and kind of made it such that it will sound consciously different in these different places. So, you know, obviously what you'll hear um, is kind of meaningless in relation to all that. And yet, just as to bring the, to evoke the sound worlds of that piece, maybe it's nice to just play, um, what is it? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a sound file uh, labeled D01.
I just, I wanted to, I, I think we always forget, or not always, but to mention just some funny little anecdotes before I stop talking and hand it back to you, Amy. But um, just, again, to emphasize sort of, I hope everyone was sort of imagining how much more rich, how much more intense they could have been as it was installed in that particular building through that particular building as a certain kind of mediating body. Um, but two things, one, just that, um, which I think is delightful that the performance started at midnight, um, which somehow I think gives a different tonal cast to the whole thing. And two, just the, the account that um, Paulino Veros uh, attended this, um, but I find it just sort of telling and amusing that um, all of the kind of richness, the objects, the the places of interest, all of that 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 Amy was describing, all this this basically what is Marianne's work, all of those elements, uh, Oliveros missed because she was afraid to go inside because it seemed too loud for her. Oh, I think you're on mute again, Amy. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, oh, great, great. Yeah, that's so that's one of the things that has come up for me in the interviews that I've done with, with a number of people who attended or attended Living Sound. Um, yeah, many people were fearful to venture inside. And then some of the people that did go inside um, were so overcome by this intensity that they didn't see the call um with maybe the exception of um of Neely bruce who has a really cool account of this in alvin lucier's book um he seems to have put the pieces together in a kind of compelling way um but that's actually a nice segue to go back to the clues. I've talked a lot about this idea of story, walking into the world of a story, um, following clues. But then that, of course, begs the question, well, what were the actual clues? Um, so if we can please go to slide number 32. OK, great, great, great. Um, so what we have here is um, a like a close up of one of the uh, storyboards, um, typewritten storyboards that Amache used in Living Sound. And um, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, some bits and pieces of these They're sort of sentence fragments um, and sort of gestures and um, uh, kind of little like interesting images that are evoked here. And you'll see this kind of really interesting combination of um, ideas of uh, microorganismal life and also common practice associated with the orchestra. Um, so we have enhancing positive acceleration by sound feed energy, creating the molecular orchestra, Beginning of a violin factory. Sharpening intonation with direct Mozart A, 421.6 hertz feed. Direct sound growth to sound food to enhance the growth of the new musicians. Making new scores. And then the, I saved this one for last. Intentionally enhancing recognition of, intention, of additional tones by microorganismal stimuli. Um, so uh, these clues kind of like distributed throughout the house. Some are original texts like this one written by Amache. She also used um, excerpts from science fiction, um, some pieces of New York Times science news. So some of this has the feeling of being sort of ripped from the headlines. Um, and sort of what we're seeing as we're, she's mixing in the clues, um, sort of new developments in science and biotechnology um, with music historical gestures towards the orchestra, sort of all in the name of enhancing what she calls um, additional tones or what we might know as her ear tone music. 
Um, so we get this kind of really interesting sci-fi mix and match um, that really asks like what forms of life and what forms of sort of musicking or what kinds of ensembles could really center um, and enhance our bodily responses to music, which are also so central like to our ways of listening. So I see this story here as a sort of very daringly original, um, almost like sci-fi speculation about um, what kinds of historical and material and indeed lively supports we might imagine um, to be part of ways of listening that center um, our bodies and our own um, um, sort of constitutive responses to sound. Um, so I think this is a really cool, there's a really cool kind of double layering going on here where as a format, um, music for sound drawing rooms is itself a very like super active and super involved way of listening that tells a story that is also about a super active and super involved way of listening as a kind of fiction right um and so um i think yeah there's these kind of this double layering or this weaving together of experienced ways of listening with fictive ways of listening with speculative ways of listening kind of all rolled into one as we move through the scene and attach sound characters to clues um, as we move. Um, and I'll just go ahead and conclude this short section. Again, I'd like to do it in Amishay's words. And if we could please jump to um, slide 35. Um, I'll go ahead and read a, um, a sort of later formulation of how she describes the series, which I think summarizes what I've uh, attempted to spin out in a, in a really beautiful way. So I'll go ahead and read this bit of text here. Um, in Music for Sound Joined Rooms, the architecture of a building, an entire house or rooms, walls, and other features is used to create the sound structures and to evolve stories with scenes and episodes, which are dramatized by the music and the sets, including photography, graphics, video and projected images, lighting, furniture, sculpture, and text. The idea is to create an atmosphere that gives the drama of walking into a cinematic close-up and being part of the scene, surrounded by its sounds and images. The audience walks into the world of the story, enters the sets. I use the architectural features of a building to create intensely dramatic sound experiences, which cannot be created any other way. A form of sound art that uses the architecture of rooms specifically to magnify the expressive dimensions of the music. With the dramatic concepts of these works, I wish to achieve a new genre for experiencing sound, distinct from minimalist and more passive installation forms as developed in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and so I think this brings things kind of full circle in a really interesting way. So not only has Amache rejected the proscenium bound concert setting, she also rejects, let me keep my hand in the frame here. She also rejects the kind of more passive, um, endless duration sound installation. So um, music for sound joined rooms and as we'll see, um, many sounds, many, many sound series, which Bill will speak about in just a moment, um, are ways to kind of give such an experience um, a dramatic or even a narrative structure that also leaves space for what she calls um, the personal time of listening, which again is where all these ways of listening um, in the world of the story would um, effloresce. Now, she continued to work in the Music for Sound Join Rooms format, um, again, starting in 1980, um, through the end of her life. Um, 
and continue to use the, the kind of the tools of structured born sound um, in the mini sound series, which is which Bill will speak about in a moment. Um, but their kind of narrative and diegetic constructions um, function in sort of different ways. And so um, let me maybe hand it over to Bill now to um, to to build on that um, other these other ways of becoming in, involved in the story, so to speak. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I love this passage that you just read. I mean, it's just, it's so remarkable um, that, you know, whenever this text is written, like, I think this text that you're reading from is maybe slightly later. It's somewhere between 80 and 85, and I forget. But um, she's strongly rejecting sort of museum presentation that like, basically, like, um, art installation presentation is as sort of limited as reactionary as concert recital presentation, which is quite a quite a statement. I think it's also quite beautiful in these works, starting with music for Sandra and Room, starting with a wonderful piece like Living Sound, Patent Pending, you really see you can you can sort of feel the energy in her writing and the work she's doing at that time because it's like this blossoming of so many ideas that she's been had she's had and been working with for so long sort of coalescing where the sort of radicality of the ideas about perception about presentation about presence about appearance etc um really sort of sort of fused together into as she puts it a new genre um uh, no longer a presentational format that is inherited really something where she is really in as many dimensions as possible uh creating the presentational conditions for the work itself um and as exciting and wonderful as that is that's also exactly the dimension that for the rest of her life from 1980 on she was not able to do very often um, because uh, presenters both in music and in um, visual art um seem to not appreciate her or kind of understand um, uh, this attempt. So she really had an uphill battle trying to do this, and there really were then only a handful of times when she was able to realize this kind of vision, including um, the 2002 Puerto piece. So if we could go to slide number 38, which is just a few uh, ahead, uh, a few more. Well, there we are, this one. This incredible, glamorous image. Um, comes from um, what Amy was sort of announcing a moment ago, um, what she called the mini sound series, which is also, as she said, a sort of narrative development from this architecturally staged um, uh, type of work. And the first piece she made in this way uh, was in 1985 at the Cap Street Project in San Francisco, it's kind of a artist residency program and she, and she really was given free reign there to make something very new and in this case um, not only is uh, you know there are all kinds of different manner of, of uh, props and objects and images etc you know um, as we see here this is a replica of Freud's uh, uh, couch uh, behind her you see projections on the wall um, of sort of um, close-ups of William Blake drawings uh, all kinds of other things going on in this image, obviously. Um, but what happens here is she takes on the serial format. And um, I think implicit uh, in, in what Amy was just telling us and all this fascinating stuff with music for sound during rooms, you know, what happens is the, the sort of reintroduction of narrative uh, into the work is also very much a kind of formalist um, problem. You know, like if, if you think about it in terms of if suddenly you are thinking on the scale, the, the scale, the scale of an entire building, um, and you really are determining um, all of the kind of conditions of audibility and visibility in that building, the question then, very literally, of how a listener, a visitor, a viewer is to move through that space, how to choreograph the experience of the listener becomes. Um, really key, and one way in a in a sort of um, bounded one occasion piece like Living Sound Patent Pending, as Amy was describing, is to do that with these places of interest, with objects, with these kind of cues. That the choreography of listening occurs um, by drawing listeners through the space toward these particular places where certain kinds of listening happen. Um, in mini sound series, there's an expansion even beyond that, beyond the bounds of a single occasion, um, toward a different uh, development over time, 
So if we can go to the next slide. I'll read a little bit about this. Um, she writes, and this is actually, a, this is a, like a bit of a draft. I think this is an unpublished text. She writes, the situation. We are now nearing the end of the 20th century with every possible advance in audio technology, yet the experience of music in public places is confined to 19th century listening and audience situations. We enter and leave, experience images and various kinds of sound art in the galleries and museums of the world. To experience more of the expressive dimensions of music, we go to the auditoriums, concert halls, the opera, or clubs. All are inadequate for late 20th century musical productions. To my knowledge, no sound houses exist. Hopefully soon there will be sound houses, incredibly beautiful, magical sound houses where music may be experienced as it's not possible in the home. And no doubt there soon will be. Technology, in fact, just as uh, in the era of great painting of the Sistine Chapel or Florence, now it is the same for sound creations. No longer confined to musicians, an artist, composer, paints with sound, creates a ceiling, beaming its intricate rays. Um, yeah, that last bit is a bit funny. Um, um, but this is sort of just sort of setting the stage for her thinking about presentation in relation to these works. If we could jump ahead two slides to slide 41. Um, just the next one after that. Yes, this one. Again, we have a uh, storyboard, like Amy shared with us uh, for the other work. In this case, this deals with the mini sound series. And when and when we say mini sound series, she means it literally. She's thinking about okay, this is 1985. She's thinking about like Dallas. She's thinking about. Um, television miniseries, one episode after the other, that have cliffhangers at the end, you know, where someone's shot and you don't know if they survive. So on this one, if we look at this and we can read some of this, um, I'll read all of this and it, it, it repeats a little bit of what Amy just read, but I think in this context it kind of expands it as well. She says, the idea is to create an atmosphere that gives the drama of walking into a cinematic close-up and being part of the scene, surrounded by its sound and images. The audience walks into the world of the story, enters the sets. I wanted the kind of engaging format that television has developed, with all the ready-made mind stuff of the miniseries form. An evolving sound work to be continued, as distinguished from continuous installation or traditional concert genre. As a form, the miniseries is powerful and challenging, yet up to now, only television develops it. And then this next little bit, which is on the right, it gives a little bit of a storyline account in, in her kind of wonderfully expressive um, language. All of these characters, by the way, that she mentions are existing characters, like these were the components of this piece that she named this way. The lead characters are five or more major sound shapes, staged architecturally and interacting dramatically with each other. The stars of the mini sound series, their interactions, and those of the supporting characters, other sound shapes appearing in different episodes, are developed in the storyline. What happens when wave number four, what, sorry, what happens to wave number four when it's set up to meet the fright? deep and deepest tone disappears. Was it really shot down by the hard beat force? Will it reappear? When it does, two weeks later, it's supporting the coast, who we know has fallen in love with God's big noise. So this kind of wonderful poetics of this text, um, she, she is fully engaged and fully committed to. And yet one can also think of this again, formally, structurally, in terms of making work. You have these sound characters, you have these bits of audio that have really distinct audio signatures. They, they emphasize certain aspects of the frequency spectrum. They do certain, they produce certain, uh, certain um, quote unquote, psychoacoustic effects and listeners, et cetera. And she uses these quite literally as characters. One has this name, one has this name. When you combine these two in a crossfade, in a collision, in a hard cut, and all these kind of complex forms of disappearance and interference, kind of what happens. It's a way of sort of bringing people into the narrative progression of the pieces. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is a poster for Soundhouse, um, not a sound house as a concept, but rather the title of the first iteration of this, the mini sound series, this ongoing format that she would then 
uh, continue for the rest of her life. I don't know if you can see it, um, but again, um, if you see on the left, it lists the names of the episodes. As it says, six features starting up Saturdays at 9 p.m. Um, the features being The Painted Night, The Jet Sono, Secret Sound, A Step Into It, The Painted Night Again, The Jet Sono Again, etc. And um, anecdotally, what, what, um, if we go to the next slide, um, the next slide, um, some of you, if you're Amish fans, may recognize the image on the left of her at the mixing board there in Cap Street. This image was featured on the cover of a sort of like, the sort of, you know, San Francisco's version of like Time Out. Um, and apparently from all the anecdotal accounts we've heard, this was a wildly successful work. And beyond the six or so episodes that were announced, she had to repeat them. There were lines outside that somehow this, this kind of engaging ongoing series um, really worked. If we go to the next one. Um, or before we go to the next slide, you can see also on the right, um, these are just some more images of the installation that include the sort of really heavy and also very heavily 80s kind of um, visual aesthetics of the projections on the wall that she did in collaboration with Scott Fisher. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, just some more of the image, the kind of image world from there. Um, these are again sort of uh, appropriated sort of images that she, she incorporated into her own work. The next slide. Um, again, you just sort of see the sort of spatial distortions of the, the multiple projections on different surfaces in the space. The next slide, um, just a clearer shot of the room again with the sort of Blake in the background, Freud couch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then just again, I think in a, in a funny way, the, the sound examples that we have here are so much um, examples of failure or examples of limitation. But again, we'll play some sound associated, or no, we can play a little video that we have a little video associated mm -hmm. with this work, a document which is um, not so commonly seen. But um, after everything we've said, all of the richness we've described, and also obviously the serial format of this, the narrative context of this, it's um, almost absurd to just watch this little bit. In any case, it's maybe anecdotally interesting just to have a tiny taste of the sound and image world of the piece. So if we could watch the, um, the, uh, the video, which I believe is uh, called E01.
Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to be a little bit aware of the time here. And of course, as uh, we're, we're far over prepared. So I think if we could just sort of relatively quickly, just sort of for a few seconds on each image, just scroll through some of the next mm -hmm. images. Basically, the next little section we'd planned was just to be um, describing this, for instance, was a mini sound series that she made in Berlin. You can I'll see a few images from that if you go to the next one. Um, um, if we just keep, yeah, the, oh, some text about it, you can just go through this quickly. Um, so the next image, the next image. Um, yeah, you can't really see very clearly, but these are some further images from Berlin. If you go to the next image, um, it's kind of a fascinating aspect of this, which we can't go into now in Berlin, the installation there, which was called the Music Rooms. She created what she, uh, what she called the Pop Murals, which were made from uh, the British, British Music Press at the time. If we keep going, next image. Um, these are just some sort of stills of, a, of an edition of postcards that she had made as a component of this work. Uh, next image, more of those. Next image, this is just a, a kind of heroic shot of her there in the installation taken by Renee Block. Uh, next image, um, this is the invitation um, to the Bi Orals, which is kind of a cute name. Um, uh, another mini sound series that she made in Philadelphia. And this is just sort of interestingly or anecdotally um, something that Amy and I engaged with a little bit more because. I guess it was two years ago, the timeline of the last year is totally blurred, but the last time um, this kind of collective uh, of uh, associates of Amishes that we're both uh, a part of got together to try to um, approach realizing some of this work without her. It was in uh, Philadelphia, uh, presented by Blank Forms and Bowerbird, and this uh, the Bi Orals uh, was a sort of reference point for, for that piece. If we go to the next one, next image, this is, uh, oh, it's that's somehow um, inverted, but you can still see it. It's a, this was a Dutch mini sound series that she made in the nineties called Stolen Souls. And then next image. Okay, so this finally takes us sort of to our last little bit and we'll try not to go too much over time, but um, this is obviously the poster for the work she made at uh, Sir Alves in 2002. The Sounding of Casa de Sir Alves, Supreme Connections being the title, which is a really interesting suggestive title, which we'll just touch on for the, the briefest moment <laughs> in, a mo uh, in a minute, but we can't really get into too much, but there's actually very, very specific resonances built into that. If we go to the next image, um, the next image, I don't know if he knows that I have this, but this is an email written by uh, Pedro Rocha in 2012 that was sent to Toby Meyer that offers uh, a kind of an account of what more specifically Amshay was thinking about and working with at the time. One thing I want to pull out of this that's interesting, um, if you remember oh, two hours ago, whenever it was that we started from that uh, image we showed, a lot of the visitors were, were wearing these kind of, were wearing red cloth over their feet. Um, as it says here, um, the red shoes uh, were a way for people not to make noise when wandering in the house, but also something to trigger a different mindset. Um, uh, and the color related to a piece of red silk that was shown in one of the rooms. The room was adjacent to the place where the goats were, and on the same room there was a copy of an article from Time magazine that Marianne had read on the plane on her way to Porto. This article was about the production of spider silk from the milk of genetically modified goats. When Marianne learned we had goats in the farm, she immediately thought about this article and the supreme connection described. Um, this is just a nice thing to pull out because then I wanted to connect that also to what Amy was talking about with living sound to the very specific sort of like headline news aspect uh, of some of the sort of conceptual and visual props uh, of the work. Um, if, if, if everyone will be so gracious to let us go a few minutes over time, we can also share just a, a few little more documents. There's one really charming piece of audio that I'd like to share here. 
Um, it's kind of bad audio quality, but it really um, playfully emphasizes this kind of headline quality of the work. Um, this is not at all an artwork. It's just something that was found uh, among Marianne's things on a cassette tape. Um, not even sure when exactly it's from, but it was a cassette tape labeled Marianne's News. And um, this is literally just a recording. It's just a minute or so long, a minute and a half long of her reading science news headlines. If we could listen to that F00. Comets are thought to be something like dirty popsicles. Well, acknowledging that some of the dust chemically resembles carbonous chondrites, the most primitive of all the meteorites, Dr. Brownlee said that based on more than 500 particles he has examined, we believe we have seen a different kind of extraterrestrial material that has not been found in known meteorites, and some of it must have come from comets. When comets streak in close to the sun, they warm up and dissipate some of their nucleus, scattering particles. If these are some of the particles that eventually reach the Earth as cosmic dust, Dr. Brownlee said, then it is possible that scientists now have in their hands samples of material from the outer reaches of the solar system, where the comets presumably originated. If so, the cosmic dust could contain material left over after the creation of the giant outer planets or residue from the primordial dust and gas cloud out of which the solar system arose. The prospects excites Dr. Brownlee. This dust, Dr. Brownlee observed, may be our one chance for a long time to study something older than the solar system, something truly galactic. just a very, I think, delightful taste of something. Um, there's just two more things we want to share. And maybe, like, like I said, it, one of them just has to be an incredibly small thumbnail of an incredibly massive and important uh, thing in her work. So again, um, as, as I said, the title of the work for Sir Alves was um, The Sounding of Casa de Sir Alves, colon, Supreme Connections. Supreme Connections was not just uh, meant in the literal sense of a supreme connection as described like in the email, like the connection between, you know, the chance occurrence of reading about these, uh, you know, um, genetically modified goats and their milk creating a certain kind of silk and, and then finding that there are goats at the institution. Supreme Connections is actually a term that emerges in what is probably the largest league the largest scale uh, idea of Amche's uh, from around 1980, uh, an unfortunately entirely unrealized uh, work called Intelligent Life, um, which she called all kinds of things. Sometimes she called it a media opera. It was going to be a massive simultaneous radio and television broadcast science fiction series. Um, the simultaneous radio and television broadcast uh, being uh, conceived so that uh, listeners at home could have multiple channels of audio and you could do sort of more interesting mm -hmm. things with the sound than just a simple, um, you know, one source uh, audio thing. And this was going to be made. She was working with De Apple in Amsterdam, as well as Philips and a lot of other big partners. Incredibly tragic situation. She worked on this for years. Um, the director and the sort of the team of the Apple, the institution that was heading up this initiative, actually all died in a plane crash, uh, after which um, the project fell apart and she was never able to realize it. But what exists of this project remained incredibly crucial for her as a reference point. What exists is what she called a treatment. Um, it exists in various versions, let's say uh, something like a 150 page long manuscript uh, that includes images and text that describe um, how this series, Intelligent Life, would have worked technically, her kind of conceptual thinking about what that means, but it also includes specific things like a draft of a script for uh, two episodes of the series. It also includes a history of the future, what happened according to the science fiction world that she's creating between 1980 and 2021, this year, uh, which is the year the series uh, in 1980 was conceived to take place in. 
Um, and supreme connections in that context mean something very different. So if we could just see the next image, please. Um, uh, yes, this image is actually the cover of one of the editions of the treatment. This incredibly, um, she kept this document kind of top secret. Uh, it really was sort of like a secret source for a lot of her work. If we could see the next image, uh, you can't really see there, but this is just the title page. It's just sort of, um, she, you know, she, she calls it Intelligent Life, a media opera designed for television and radio simulcast, a musical occurring in the future to be presented as a multi-part series. If we see the next image, um, here, this is part of the sort of conceptual framing of it. It, it says, theater in the home. Intelligent life might be described as a media opera that uses actual broadcasting media to create a theater in the home. In the tradition of grand opera, it is designed as a unique occasion, dramatic, extravagant, extraordinary. An adventure series about our minds. Intelligent life creates a space of expanded hearing and seeing. To accomplish this, imagination and understanding are charged by the intensity of a new image sound atmosphere. And then the next image, please. And this one, if you could maybe get in a little bit closer, this is uh, this is really fascinating. This is actually a storyboard. Um, part of what it, one of the things that exists around this unrealized work is a storyboard for a complete episode. If you can see it, um, there are four parallel tracks that that describe sort of four different kind of components that are going on. At the top, you have the theme, which in this case is the lab. Um, and the second level is called action, which is like actually what, what is happening. You see little images of like, you know, characters doing things. Then the third layer down is sound. And in this particular case, you can see what's described at that particular moment in this um, is a sort of triangulation between the stereo channels of the radio broadcast and the mono or sort of singular um, channel of the television. And at the bottom, you see the time scale. Um, uh, in this case, if this is going from minute, uh, I believe, minute 16 to minute 17 in the series. So it was actually incredibly specifically conceived, this series. And the lab that's referenced there, if we can go to the next image, is uh, none other than the lab known as Supreme Connections. Um, this is from a description that's part of the, the episode she writes. They must drive quickly to the branch of Supreme Connections, Inc. at Hornhusen, Aplissa's favorite laboratory. There is an important staff meeting. The team of researchers composers must be briefed on a number of projects. The laboratory staff has been working hard to prepare the new results Aplissa and Ty will present on a TV talk show later in the day. On the Sensations of Tones, a weekly VPRO TV broadcast. Um, part of this, yeah, kind of world of that series. Um, so, sort of, that's just sort of this interesting, sort of latent reference for that title, um, Thrallways. Um, there's one little other clip that we have to play, but maybe before we jump out of that, and I'm sorry for speeding through this incredibly dense thing, but do you want to add anything about Intelligent Life that I've forgotten before we show this last clip, Amy? I would love to add just a few things. Um, I, there's so much to say about this project. Um, uh, in one of the seminars that we gave a, a few years ago, someone asked, you know, well, what actually happens in the TV show or in the in the series? And I think it's really interesting to underscore that it's it's a story about researchers. Um, the the central protagonists in this kind of sci-fi future world are themselves researchers in um, perception and acoustics and various like speculative um, music technologies. And so, um, you know, much in, in some ways very resonant with Living Sound is resonant with some of the other projects. This is another really experimental novel format um, that could kind of serve as a narrative container for sort of further reflection on um, on ways on on different ways of listening. In fact, some of the ways in which the treatment unfolds actually invite the in-home audience to hear 
proper sound in situ as though they're hearing from the perceptual standpoint of one of the other characters. So there's and that still these further layers of intersubjective listening, of virtual transport, of being kind of folded into the world of the story um, that I think extends um, through Music for Sound Join Rooms and many sound series in really interesting ways. Um, the little bit from the treatment that Bill shared, um, I don't know if you can kind of uh, think back to the image for a moment. Um, the two like research partner protagonists walk into the laboratory, and all along the walls are glowing petri dishes um, in which microorganisms are being cultivated um, with uh, to become ultra sensitized to specific types of uh, acoustical or spectral or even genre-based um, sound worlds. And so again, um, part of the science fiction world is like changing listening and responsivity at the very, very level, um, at the very like molecular level, at the, at the basis of kind of vital material itself. And so I wanted to point out, I don't wanna get too deep into the, actual diegesis because it's so rich and so so complicated um, but there are still resonances between what we're seeing here in the media opera treatment and some of the themes and kind of conceptual supports as well as perceptual experiences that get staged um, in um, music for sound join rooms and mini sound series so i wanted to just kind of br you know bring things into um this kind of nice, uh, um, these various points of, of connection. I think that's a wonderful way to sort of wrap it up or, and also to point it towards the very end of our, our thing. Um, and what sort of, what it pulls together, you use the word, I think, ultra sensitize uh, in terms of these kind of, these entities, these microorganisms that are growing. But in a certain sense, as I think we've been trying to emphasize, Amishay's project I mean, you, you said this also about um, music for sound drawing rooms. There's a funny sort of doubling, like a story about a story. And through experiencing that story, we experience what the story is actually about. There are these funny kind of things that are going on there. Um, Intelligent Life would have been the sort of supreme example of that. But to think then exactly. of the kinds of experience that she's offering us as listeners as things that that also ultra sensitize us or the way she i think in, in one text writes um they sort of they help us find what she calls our unnamed sensibilities and that was one of the the, the sort of biggest ideas in a certain sense that she has there's a, a text that's also in the book that we edited uh call, um, called the head stretch and she she laments our sort of confinement to what she calls the middle range, the sort of normative space of sensation in which we move in our everyday lives and um, tries to sort of then awaken us to the sensory capacities of our bodies in ways that are maybe radically incompatible with all kinds of things in the world or with the world as such, I mean, they're incompatible with notions of gender and passivity and activity and racialization and all kinds of things. But all these kind of material capacities that are there and can be used or modes of touch that can happen in different ways. Mm -hmm. And in a funny way, the commitment to this very, very broad project, um, I think she really saw as more crucial than any of the particular instances of any of these things. So we wanted to end with, again, her, giving her the last word, a very tiny, tiny little video clip, um, just like 20 seconds long, where she says something really incredible, though. Um, it's from, I think, 2006 at an award ceremony where she was given the Golden Nika in uh, Linz at the Ars Electronica Festival. Okay you know, kind of like a lifetime achievement award, which for someone who I think was really not interested in her earlier work is a bit of a funny thing. Um, and what she says there is so vivid though and so amazing. She totally dismisses her artworks. She refers to her stupid sound work and uh, really sort of centers what she actually thinks is going on. So if we could just play this final short, tiny clip, we'll then shut up. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I believe it's labeled F01. I just like learning more because I don't understand this. And so if I can associate 
my stupid sound work, where I learned something more about the reality of the, my existence. I mean, it's just a fragment, but but it's that's I think just um, such a, a beautiful statement to come from someone sort of late in their career. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's all I would like to sort of say. And I know we're wildly over time, so I don't know if there's really space or time for questions. Of course, we'd be very open to them. We can also receive them virtually or by email or whatever. If there's not time for them now. Um, however you like, but but yeah, thanks everyone for your prolonged attention. Thank you, Bill and, and Amy, yeah. for for sharing all this knowledge with us and uh, take us deeper into the world of Marian Amasher. Um, I don't know if there's someone here in the audience that would like to to make some questions. It's already already quite late, but uh, maybe we have time for one or two questions. Well, I don't think uh, there's questions here in the room. Maybe they can, oh, oh there's one question uh, over there. It's Thomas Anker Smith. Uh, well, I have a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> uh, thanks for a very uh, beautiful, fun talk. Um, I was sort of collecting questions as you guys were talking. Um, I guess one, two questions is, so there's a new book out, um, Collected Writing, something like that, and that's, is that out now? Or, ah oh shit, it's actually there, like I walked in late, okay, that's, that's, that'll, that settles that. Um, and Amy, you're, you're working on another book, right? Uh, yes, I am. It's actually done and um, and will come out in April, I think. Super. It's called Wild Sound. Um, the... Yes. The, yes. Um, Go ahead, Bill. Sorry, no, I was just going to say about our book, um, we can also maybe sidestep that issue just slightly because I think what will happen after we stop talking here is we're going to share an introduction to a sort of series of celebrations of the book where we talk about the book at more length. Um, so you get to listen to us even more, but it's us at a different time. So we're wearing different clothes. Okay. Um, maybe I can squeeze in one more question that, that, that you guys could answer quickly. Um, I was wondering, so, Early on, she, I mean, you, I, and I have to, I walked in late, but you, I walked in when you were, you were talking about adjacency, so kind of wrapping that up, um, essentially a percussion piece, and then, um, um, on Sunday, there'll be the, the piece for two pianos from the 1980s. And then I remember uh, Bill back in, what was it, 2006 in Berlin, the, the, the piece Glia. So these are all examples of, of um, pieces for conventional instruments. Now, I was sort of wondering how long did that disappear for? Because I recently met a, I met a guy at a, at a concert, and I, I was, it was after a concert of my own, and I was distracted and stuff, but I met a guy, he came up to me in Los Angeles about a year ago, saying that he had played tuba, for, for a piece of Amache's um, seemingly somewhere in the city, uh, I think he was saying that he was lying on top of a truck <laughs> or like <laughs> he, was, he was in some kind of industrial setting. He was saying something like he was by, by a dump truck or something and, and he was, so he was on location and there was a live feed was my understanding. So I was just curious to how, how, how present was that that, 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 that presence of acoustic instruments, is that something that sort of trickled into her work from time to time? Serge Cherepnin actually asked me this recently himself, who was close to Marianne in the late 60s, um, and I didn't have a straight answer for him. I think it's sort of a question of emphasis in a certain way. Um, uh, programmatically, conceptually, um, she, 
never returns to them, even though there are pieces for instruments, is the way I would put it if I was going to put it a little bit polemically. Um, and what I mean by that is she never returns to them in the sense of um, their classical function and the ways of listening associated with them. Um, in the literal sense, you're, you're totally right, they never entirely go away. Um, in different iterations of the City Link series, for instance, um, she involves instrumentalists um, in many different ways. Eberhard Bloom uh, plays the flute in an anechoic chamber remotely in one of the City Link's pieces in 1980. George Lewis plays trombone while John Cage reads uh, text, all from different locations, and Amche mixes them all in the kitchen. Um, as you mentioned, there's the piece Petra from the early 90s, there's the piece Glia. Um, I think the City Links related pieces are a bit more of an exception. Um, the later, or sorry, are, are they're more folded into her broad practice than the two later pieces, Petra and Glia, are very much exceptions. Um, but whenever she uses instruments or includes them in the work later on, it's definitely along her own lines. Um, it's definitely about a way of listening more than a sort of a way of playing. She, in a certain sense, um, was then very interested in working with very specific players who had very developed, uh, very developed uh, instrumental practices. But what's so interesting is what she heard in those practices. I remember, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I'll, I'll, <laughs> I won't babble too much, but um, I remember, for instance, um, being with her at a certain point and her um, like in Berlin, to make a specific example, and she we attended a, a concert of Charles Curtis together, and he was playing some of Alvin Musquet's later music, and um, and uh, she was an amazing listener at concerts too, because she would like speak aloud during it, like in the middle of the concert. Oh, how beautiful! Like full voice, um, but. Um, what she heard was not necessarily the surface of the work at all, or not, not, not necessarily, not at all, the um, quote unquote musical in the historical classical sense material that was going on. She wasn't interested in like melody or harmony or, or that, those kind of semantic sort of uh, grammatical things. She was rather interested, and she writes about this too, in how the forms of articulation, the, the subtleties of touch, and intonation and um, ways of playing activate these latent and nascent unnamed sensibilities in listeners. So in that sense, she was, you know, she loved certain kinds of, you know, just vernacular songs and things like this too. But when she would listen to a song, I'm thinking like, for instance, she loved the old version of Blue Velvet, or, you know, just trying off the top of my head, one example, or like close, close to the end of her life, she was listening to, um, <laughs> she was listening to the sort of funny, very moody Frank Sinatra album, Frank Sinatra Sings Only for the Lonely, um, which is, I don't know, one can think whatever one wants about that album, but what she's listening to when she listens to those things is according to the practice of listening that she has developed and sustained for a long time. She's not listening to the uh, pretty melody or the, the figures, um, which she speaks of so dismissively in so much of her writing. Rather, she's listening to how what the musician does addresses us as receivers how it speaks to forms of receptive intelligence that are in us, even if we don't necessarily know it. Um, that's maybe a sort of long roundabout answer. Oh, well, great, Bill. That's, I, um, that's super wonderful. Um, I'm just going to maybe hone in on a, a, a tiny part of the question, um, which is that kind of anecdote that you conjure, like the tuba player and the dump truck in the industrial location. Um, that sounds to me like um, one of the City Links projects um, titled Everything in Air that um, Amache staged at the Walker Art Center in 1974. And it reminds me to underscore sort of how in some ways, like diverse and heterogeneous, the entire Complexity Link series um, like really is. Um, on the one hand, we have, you know, the year long lead to the studio, um, which is very well known. Um, and then a handful of 
um, projects in which she um, routed a live feed into a gallery space and sort of left it unattended, but also, um, you know, accompanied by various visual cues. And, you know, these different approaches each have their own kind of time cycle, right? It's like learning the t learning the cycles of a remote location over a matter of years versus a matter of months, et cetera. Um, some of the City Links pieces were much, much, were bounded in much smaller units of time. So um, everything in air in both um, Chicago and in the Twin Cities were sort of evening length events um, in which Amache would mix live tapes um, with the remote feed um, for maybe little hours in Minneapolis, it was a late night concert. It lasted, I think, from 11 p.m. Uh, to 1 a.m. And so the idea is this sort of super intense, super concentrated um, experience of long distance listening um, in these kind of secret hours late at night. And in some of those projects, yes, um, she would station a live performer next to one of the remote microphones and um again to really resonate with what bill is saying sort of being interested in what a performer might do um to respond in real time to the changes of environmental sound um etc um the addition of a live performer was in some ways simply adding another way of long distance listening or another event of long distance listening um to these kind of layered and networked um, experiences. So I think that's one way to sort of understand um, that performer um, that you spoke to, but then also Lewis and Eberhard Bloom's uh, contributions to um, the City Links projects throughout the 70s.